Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're a Secure Estate Solutions. My name is Grayson Geiler, and I'd like to put weekly market updates out for you. We'll take a financial topic and go into some detail about it. Today, I'd like to talk about a new European debt crisis. So many times when we're talking about what's going on in the world financial markets, we focus on the Federal Reserve, and we frequently talk about how some of their behavior um, what what they've been pouring into the into the financial markets is a little bit crazy and we frequently refer to the bank of japan as the worst offender in this print and buy assets game that's going on in the in the world's financial markets uh but today we're going to extend a little uh a little bit of focus out to the european union we're going to talk about what's going on over there um lots of debt problems in the entire developed world of course um you know, and a lot of people are talking about maybe we just need to have a debt jubilee, uh, which is back in historical times, biblical times, even debt jubilees were fairly common where a ruler or a king uh, may just exonerate people of their debts, um, free slaves, free indentured servants, just a, a jubilee. It was actually quite common back then. Uh, you know, fast forward to modern times, we, there, we have no shortage of examples of debts going bad um, in the modern world. I mean, one of my favorite, I mean, some of them actually get uh, quite comical. My favorite on that front is Argentina, you know, ever since their liberation from Spain in the early 1800s, they have defaulted or restructured their debt nine times. Uh, and it really got crazy in 2017. They had already defaulted or restructured eight times, and they issued a 100-year bond. Um, the uh, most of it was denominated in foreign currencies, including the U.S. dollar, including the Swiss franc. But it was oversubscribed, meaning there were more people trying to invest in the bonds uh, than there were bonds available. For Argentina, their government having defaulted eight times, people wanted to loan them money for a hundred years, and uh, it, the the interest rate went off about seven percent. Lo and behold, of course, they're blaming it on COVID. We're already restructuring that hundred-year bond, uh, so valuations have lost about fifty percent, and we're restructuring already. It's it. it I couldn't even believe it was going on when it was. That's kind of the nature of our debt markets now, you know, and what people need to understand when um, there's a debt jubilee, when there's a restructuring or a default of debt, there's someone who owes that money, but there's also someone who owns that debt. So every time we talk about, you know, a good example here in America is people talking about, well, student loan debt should be wiped out. Well, it's not. It's just not that easy. Um, a lot of the government agencies, our the U.S. government owns more than a trillion of those student loans. Uh, a lot of our government agencies are using the payments that are coming in off those loans as their working capital, as the, as their income stream. So, where does the money come from if we just uh, restructure that debt or 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 completely erase it? Um, so. You know, you look back in at historical times, and it may be a situation where a king, a ruler, uh, has to have a debt jubilee just to keep the stability of the society. Well, that's one person or one entity's asset that they're wiping out to keep to keep control of the situation. It's not that way anymore. We have very sophisticated debt markets. Um, so on the other side of everyone who owes, there's someone who owns, whether it's a pension fund or a hedge fund or an individual investor or an insurance company. You can't just run around wiping out debts um, or people start to lose confidence in the underlying currency of all those debts. That's going on in Argentina right now. They've had to raise interest rates to some 60% because inflation is north of that. And imagine inflation, we've had a tough time with inflation over the last uh, few months and we're talking about 9%. Uh, 
Well, in Argentina, it's more like 60 or 70%, maybe, maybe even more. I mean, how do you even calculate it when it starts to get that? So the underlying value of the currency is one of the points I want to talk about here today. What you're looking at is the percentage of the world central bank's assets that are denominated in different currencies. So of course, the big blue part of the pie chart here is the US dollar that constitutes nearly 60% of what central banks hold as assets denominated in dollars. Well, the, the lighter shade of blue is euros. So that's the only other really significant world reserve currency, uh, the US and the euro. You look at these others, everybody else is obviously vying for a very distant third. You can look at the color coordination, the, the coordination, the Japanese yen, roughly 5%, the pound sterling, roughly 5%, other currencies, maybe 4%. Don't worry about the Chinese taking over the world monetary system. The Chinese renminbi represents about 3% of assets held by the world's uh central banks so you know the the cur again the currency and the value of the debt go hand in hand and when you look at the present situation in in euroland the the euro has come all the way back down to parity with the u.s dollar so you rewind oh six eight ten years ago and the euro was maybe a dollar thirty a dollar forty i think it got up as high as a dollar sixty uh, more than a decade ago. Well, now it's back to a dollar, almost one for one, uh, exactly. Uh, so the the situation it doesn't necessarily look dire, but man, th that's why I titled this a new European debt crisis. I mean, keep in mind, the debt situation in Europe is way worse than it was in 2012 when they actually had a debt crisis, when the World Bank, the IMF, the Troika, as they call it, had to come in and bail out, uh, restructure uh, Italy and Greece. Well, let's take a look at the numbers. 2012, Greek had sovereign debt that was about 150% of their GDP, and Italy was about 125%. When you fast forward to today, you're looking at, in Greece, you're looking at 235% of their GDP, uh, the amount of their government, the sovereign debt. Italy, 175%. You know, you start stacking Spain and Portugal and Ireland in there, it doesn't get any better. So the situation is, um, uh, again, just in, just in percentage terms, way worse than 2012. And interest rates are going higher worldwide. Uh, so it's an interesting situation. I, we don't have time to go into all the details about how different the structure of Euroland is versus the United States from a monetary perspective. But understand that it just to, to keep it oversimplified, Euroland is a lot more complex and it's it's subject to more um, more chaos and confusion. Let's put it that way. The the German economy, German debt. Uh, is much stronger than Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, much stronger. But they're all using the same currency. Um, so when when you compare that to, okay, yes, California and say South Dakota have a lot different structure um, as far as their state debt, uh, the numbers just aren't the same because as a percentage of the economy, the, the state debt is minuscule. Plus everybody has basically the same culture using the same language. Well, that's not what's going on in Euroland. I mean, the, the very structure of the Euro, um, you know, was questionable from, from the get-go, but it was designed as an alternative world reserve currency to the US dollar. Well, now that world reserve currency is coming back to parity um, is there going to be a new debt crisis? Well, that's that's not what I'm predicting, but I am I am telling you that we we have uh, more challenges in the in the near term in Euroland than we do in the U.S. And that's represented by the currencies coming back to parity. We'll probably have a euro at a discount to the U.S. dollar in fairly short order. Right now, assets are coming to America. Um,
and that's rep represented by uh, the strength of our currency. That's kind of the color commentator of where assets are going, uh, the, the uh, relative value of the currencies versus one another. Uh, the dark horse in this race is, is clearly the Chinese. They have Olympus Mons, as I call it, the, the giant volcano on Mars, uh, <clears throat> proportionally way bigger than Everest is to us. That, that's how I talk about the, the debt of China. Um, and but where that goes, we we don't know because they've got such a, a locked system. They don't have an open monetary system. Uh, so right now the assets are coming to America. Um, we expect that trend to continue, possibly accelerate, not abate. Uh, so when we're we're looking at the uh, the future of the world's reserve currencies, uh, the U.S. dollar is going to continue to get stronger, and and we don't see that we don't see. Uh, the imminent doom for the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, because what are the alternatives? Euroland is in way worse shape than we are. So that's the basics of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, keep in mind, we are um, we're here. We're available. If you like the content from today, please click like, please subscribe. Understand you can reach out to us. Uh, and we if there's uh, any way, shape or form, we can help you. We uh, offer no obligation uh, and no cost um, consultations. Uh, so reach out to us and uh, hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.